Book First, Chapter Four, Master Jacques Capanol. While the pensioner of Ghent and his eminence were exchanging very low bows and a few words in voices still lower, a man of lofty stature with a large face and broad shoulders presented himself in order to enter abreast with Guillaume Rhyme. One would have pronounced him a bulldog by the side of a fox. His felt doublet and leather jerkin made a spot on the velvet and silk which surrounded him. Presuming that he was some groom who had stolen in, the usher stopped him. "'Hold, my friend! You cannot pass!' The man in the leather jerkin shouldered him aside. "'What does this knave want with me?' said he in stentorian tones, which rendered the entire hall attentive to this strange colloquy. "'Don't you see that I am one of them?' "'Your name?' demanded the usher. "'Jacques Capanol. "'Your titles?' "'Hosier at the sign of the three little chains of Ghent.' The usher recoiled. One might bring oneself to announce aldermen and burgomasters, but a hosier was too much. The cardinal was on thorns. All the people were staring and listening. For two days his eminence had been exerting his utmost efforts to lick these Flemish bears into shape, and to render them a little more presentable to the public, and this freak was startling. But Guillaume Rhyme, with his polished smile, approached the usher. "'Announce Master Jacques Capanol, clerk of the alderman of the city of Ghent,' he whispered very low. "'Usher,' interposed the cardinal aloud. "'Announce Master Jacques Capanol, clerk of the alderman of the illustrious city of Ghent.' This was a mistake. Guillaume Rhyme alone might have conjured away the difficulty, but Capanol had heard the cardinal. "'No cross of God!' he exclaimed, in his voice of thunder. "'Jacques Capanol Hosier! Do you hear, usher? Nothing more, nothing less! Cross of God! Hosier! That's fine enough! The Monsieur the Archduke has more than once sought his gant in my hose!' Laughter and applause burst forth. A jest is always understood in Paris, and consequently always applauded. Let us add that Capanol was of the people, and that the auditors which surrounded him were also of the people. Thus the communication between him and them had been prompt, electric, and, so to speak, on a level. The haughty air of the Flemish hosier, by humiliating the courtiers, had touched in all these plebeian souls that latent sentiment of dignity still vague and indistinct in the fifteenth century. This hosier was an equal, who had just held his own before Monsieur the Cardinal. A very sweet reflection to poor fellows habituated to respect and obedience towards the underlings of the sergeants of the bailiff of saint Genevieve, the Cardinal's train-bearer. Capanol proudly saluted his eminence, who returned the salute of the all-powerful bourgeois feared by Louis the Eleventh. Then, while Guillaume Rhyme, a sage and malicious man, as Philippe de Comenet puts it, watched them both with a smile of raillery and superiority, each sought his place. The cardinal quite abashed and troubled, Capanol tranquil and haughty, and thinking, no doubt, that his title of hosier was as good as any other, after all, and that Marie of Burgundy, mother to that Marguerite whom Capanol was to-day bestowing in marriage, would have been less afraid of the cardinal than of the hosier. For it is not a cardinal who would have stirred up a revolt among the men of Ghent against the favorites of the daughter of Charles the Bold. It is not a cardinal who could have fortified the populace with a word against her tears and prayers, when the maid of Flanders came to supplicate her people in their behalf, even at the very foot of the scaffold, while the hosier had only to raise his leather elbow in order to cause to fall your two heads, the most illustrious seigneurs Guy d'Ambercourt and Chancellor Guillaume Hugonet. Nevertheless, it was over for the poor cardinal, and he was obliged to quaff to the dregs the bitter cup of being in such bad company. The reader has probably not forgotten the impudent beggar who had been clinging fast to the fringes of the cardinal's gallery ever since the beginning of the prologue. 
The arrival of the illustrious guests had by no means caused him to relax his hold, and while the prelates and ambassadors were packing themselves into the stalls, like genuine Flemish herrings, he settled himself at his ease, and boldly crossed his legs on the architrave. The insolence of this proceeding was extraordinary, yet no one noticed it at first, the attention of all being directed elsewhere. He, on his side, perceived nothing that was going on in the hall. He wagged his head with the unconcern of a Neapolitan, repeating from time to time, amid the clamour, as from a mechanical habit, "'Charity, please!' And assuredly he was, out of all those present, the only one who had not deigned to turn his head at the altercation between Capanol and the usher. Now chance ordained that the master hosier of Ghent, with whom the people were already in lively sympathy, and upon whom all eyes were riveted, should come and seat himself in the front row of the gallery, directly above the mendicant and people were not a little amazed to see the Flemish ambassador, on concluding his inspection of the knave thus placed beneath his eyes, bestow a friendly tap on that ragged shoulder. The beggar turned round. There was surprise, recognition, a lighting up of the two countenances, and so forth. Then, without paying the slightest heed in the world to the spectators, the hosier and the wretched being began to converse in a low tone, holding each other's hands, in the meantime, while the rags of Clopin Trifot, spread out upon the cloth of gold of the dais, produced the effect of a caterpillar on an orange. The novelty of this singular scene excited such a murmur of mirth and gaiety in the hall that the cardinal was not slow to perceive it. He half bent forward, and, as from the point where he was placed, he could catch only an imperfect view of Trifot's ignominious doublet he very naturally imagined that the mendicant was asking alms, and, disgusted with his audacity, he exclaimed, "'Bailiff of the courts, toss me that knave into the river!' "'Cross of God, Monseigneur the Cardinal,' said Coppenol, without quitting Clopin's hand, "'he is a friend of mine!' "'Good! Good!' shouted the populace. From that moment Master Coppenol enjoyed in Paris, as in Ghent, Great favor with the people, for men of that sort do enjoy it, says Philippe de Comenet, when they are thus disorderly. The cardinal bit his lips. He bent towards his neighbor, the abbe of saint Genevieve, and said to him in a low tone, Find ambassadors, monsieur the archduke sends here, to announce to us Madame Marguerite. Your eminence, replied the abbe, wastes your politeness on these Flemish swine. Margaritas antiporcos, pearls before swine. Say rather, retorted the cardinal with a smile, porcos anti margaritum, swine before the pearl. The whole little court in cassocks went into ecstasies over this play upon words. The cardinal felt a little relieved. He was quits with Capanol. He also had had his jest applauded. Now, will those of our readers who possess the power of generalizing an image or an idea, as the expression runs into the style of today, permit us to ask them if they have formed a very clear conception of the spectacle presented at this moment, upon which we have arrested their attention, by the vast parallelogram of the grand hall of the palace? In the middle of the hall, backed against the western wall, a large and magnificent gallery draped with cloth of gold, into which enter in procession, through a small arched door, grave personages, announced successively by the shrill voice of an usher. On the front benches were already a number of venerable figures, muffled in ermine, velvet, and scarlet. Around the dais, which remained silent and dignified, below opposite, everywhere, a great crowd and a great murmur thousands of glances directed by the people on each face upon the dais, a thousand whispers over each name. Certainly this spectacle is curious, and well deserves the attention of the spectators. But yonder, quite at the end, what is that sort of trestle-work with four motley puppets upon it, and more below? Who is that man beside the trestle, with a black doublet and a pale face? 
Alas, my dear reader, it is Pierre Gringoire and his prologue. We have all forgotten him completely. This is precisely what he feared. From the moment of the cardinal's entrance, Gringoire had never ceased to tremble for the safety of his prologue. At first he had enjoined the actors, who had stopped in suspense, to continue, and to raise their voices. Then, perceiving that no one was listening, he had stopped them. And during the entire quarter of an hour that the interruption lasted, he had not ceased to stamp, to flounce about, to appeal to Gisquette and Leonard, and to urge his neighbors to the continuance of the prologue. All in vain. No one quitted the cardinal, the embassy, and the gallery, sole center of this vast circle of visual rays. We must also believe, and we say it with regret, that the prologue had begun slightly to weary the audience at the moment when his eminence had arrived, and created a diversion in so terrible a fashion. After all, on the gallery as well as on the marble table, the spectacle was the same the conflict of labor and clergy, of nobility and merchandise. And many people preferred to see them alive, breathing, moving, elbowing each other in flesh and blood, in this Flemish embassy, in this episcopal court, under the cardinal's robe, under Campanol's jerkin, than painted, decked out, talking in verse, and, so to speak, stuffed beneath the yellow amid white tunics in which Gringoire had so ridiculously clothed them. Nevertheless, when our poet beheld quiet re-established to some extent, he devised a stratagem which might have redeemed all. "'Monsieur,' he said, turning towards one of his neighbors, a fine big man with a patient face, "'suppose we begin again.' "'What?' said his neighbor. "'Eh?' The mystery," said Gringoire. "'As you like,' returned his neighbor. This semi-approbation sufficed for Gringoire, and, conducting his own affairs, he began to shout, confounding himself with the crowd as much as possible. "'Begin the mystery again! Begin again!' "'The devil!' said Joannes de Melendino. "'What are they jabbering down yonder at the end of the hall?' For Gringoire was making noise enough for four. Say, comrades, isn't that mystery finished? They want to begin it all over again. That's not fair. No, no, shouted all the scholars. Down with the mystery, down with it. But Gringoire had multiplied himself, and only shouted the more vigorously. Begin again, begin again. These clamors attracted the attention of the cardinal. Monsieur Bailiff of the Courts, said he to a tall black man, placed a few paces from him. "'Are those knaves in a holy-water vessel that they make such a hellish noise?' The bailiff of the courts was a sort of amphibious magistrate, a sort of bat of the judicial order, related to both the rat and the bird, the judge and the soldier. He approached his eminence, and not without a good deal of fear of the latter's displeasure, he awkwardly explained to him the seeming disrespect of the audience, that noonday had arrived before his eminence, and that the comedians had been forced to begin without waiting for his eminence. The cardinal burst into a laugh. "'On my faith! The rector of the university ought to have done the same! What say you, Master Guillaume Rheim? "'Monseigneur,' replied Guillaume Rheim, "'let us be content with having escaped half of the comedy.' There is at least that much gained. "'Can these rascals continue their farce?' asked the bailiff. "'Continue, continue,' said the cardinal. "'It's all the same to me. I'll read my breviary in the meantime.' The bailiff advanced to the edge of the estrade, and cried, after having invoked silence by a wave of the hand, "'Bourgeois, rustics, and citizens!' in order to satisfy those who wish the play to begin again, and those who wish it to end, his eminence orders that it be continued. Both parties were forced to resign themselves. But the public and the author long cherished a grudge against the cardinal. So the personages on the stage took up their parts, and Gringoire hoped that the rest of his work at least would be listened to. 
This hope was speedily dispelled, like his other illusions. Silence had indeed been restored in the audience, after a fashion. But Gringoire had not observed that, at the moment when the cardinal gave the order to continue, the gallery was far from full, and that after the Flemish envoys there had arrived, new personages, forming part of the cortege, whose names and ranks shouted out in the midst of his dialogue by the intermittent cry of the usher, produced considerable ravages in it. Let the reader imagine the effect in the midst of a theatrical piece, of the yelping of an usher, flinging in between two rhymes, and often in the middle of a line, parentheses like the following, Master Jacques Chamelieu, procurator to the king in the ecclesiastical courts, Jehan de Arlay, equerry guardian of the office of Chevalier of the Night Watch of the City of Paris, Monsieur Galliot de Genoyac, Chevalier, Seigneur de Broussac, Master of the King's Artillery. Master Du Reguayer, Surveyor of the Woods and Forests of the King our Sovereign in the Land of France, Champagne, and Brie. Monsieur Louis de Gravy, Chevalier, Councillor, and Chamberlain of the King, Admiral of France, Keeper of the Forest of Vincennes. Master Denis Le Mercier, guardian of the House of the Blind at Paris, etc., etc., etc. This was becoming unbearable. This strange accompaniment, which rendered it difficult to follow the piece, made Gringoire all the more indignant because he could not conceal from himself the fact that the interest was continually increasing, and that all his work required was a chance of being heard. It was, in fact, difficult to imagine a more ingenious and more dramatic composition. The four personages of the prologue were bewailing themselves in their mortal embarrassment, when Venus, in person, Vera Incessa Patuit Dea, presented herself to them, clad in a fine robe bearing the heraldic device of the ship of the city of Paris. She had come herself to claim the dolphin promised to the most beautiful. Jupiter, whose thunder could be heard rumbling in the dressing-room, supported her claim, and Venus was on the point of carrying it off, that is to say, without allegory, of marrying Monsieur the Dauphin, when a young child, clad in white damask and holding in her hand a daisy, a transparent personification of Mademoiselle Marguerite of Flanders, came to contest it with Venus. Theatrical Effect and Change after a dispute, Venus, Marguerite, and the assistants agreed to submit to the good judgment of time Holy Virgin. There was another good part, that of the King of Mesopotamia, but through so many interruptions it was difficult to make out what end he served. All these persons had ascended by ladder to the stage. But all was over. None of these beauties had been felt nor understood. On the entrance of the cardinal, one would have said that an invisible magic thread had suddenly drawn all glances from the marble table to the gallery, from the southern to the western extremity of the hall. Nothing could disenchant the audience. All eyes remained fixed there, and the newcomers, and their accursed names, and their faces, and their costumes, afforded a continual diversion. This was very distressing." With the exception of Gisquette and Leonard, who turned round from time to time when Gringoire plucked them by the sleeve, with the exception of the big, patient neighbor, no one listened. No one looked at the poor, deserted morality full face. Gringoire saw only profiles. With what bitterness did he behold this whole erection of glory and of poetry crumbled away bit by bit? And to think, that these people had been upon the point of instituting a revolt against the bailiff through impatience to hear his work. Now that they had it, they did not care for it. This same representation which had been begun amid so unanimous an acclamation. Eternal flood and ebb of popular favor. To think that they had been on the point of hanging the bailiff's sergeant. What would he not have given to be still at that hour of honey? But the usher's brutal monologue came to an end. Everyone had arrived, and Gringoire breathed freely once more, 
the actors continued bravely. But Master Capanol, the hosier, must needs rise of a sudden, and Gringoire was forced to listen to him deliver, amid universal attention, the following abominable harangue. Messieurs the bourgeois and squires of Paris, I don't know, cross of God, what we are doing here. I certainly do see yonder in the corner on that stage some people who appear to be fighting. I don't know whether that is what you call a mystery, but it is not amusing. They quarrel with their tongues, and nothing more. I have been waiting for the first blow this quarter of an hour. Nothing comes. They are cowards who only scratch each other with insults. You ought to send for the fighters of London or Rotterdam, and I can tell you, you would have had blows of the fist that could be heard in the place. But these men excite our pity. They ought at least to give us a Moorish dance or some other mummer. That is not what was told me. I was promised a feast of fools with the election of a pope. We have our pope of fools at Ghent also. We're not behindhand in that, cross of God. But this is the way we manage it. We collect a crowd like this one here. Then each person in turn passes his head through a hole, and makes a grimace at the rest. Time one who makes the ugliest is elected pope by general acclamation. That's the way it is. It is very diverting. Would you like to make your pope after the fashion of my country? At all events, it will be less wearisome than to listen to chatterers. If they wish to come and make their grimaces through the hole, they can join the game. What say you, Messieurs les bourgeois? You have here enough grotesque specimens of both sexes to allow of laughing in Flemish fashion, and there are enough of us ugly in countenance to hope for a fine grinning match. Gringoire would have liked to retort. Stupefaction, rage, indignation deprived him of words. Moreover, the suggestion of the popular hosier was received with such enthusiasm by these bourgeois who were flattered at being called squires that all resistance was useless. There was nothing to be done but to allow oneself to drift with the torrent. Gringoire hid his face between his two hands, not being so fortunate as to have a mantle with which to veil his head, like Agamemnon of Tamantus. End of chapter 4